Hello, dear colleagues. I'm Olga Tutubalina, the moderator of this session. I'm very glad to welcome everyone to session one, the Northern Environment. And let's wait for a couple more minutes for participants to switch from the plenary session to our session. While we are waiting, I would like to introduce my co-moderator, Professor Ram Aftar from Hakkadi University, um, who will be also making the first presentation of this session. Our goal for this session is to briefly introduce our research in the six plan presentations and then discuss our potential collaborations. So this is the main goal of the session to uh, to learn about each other's research and to discuss how we can collaborate in the framework of the collaboration programs that have been already introduced in the plenary just a few minutes ago. And um, I would also like to say that after the presentations we will have uh, when we will be discussing, uh, it will be the best if you can raise, raise your, your hands, hands if you, you have, have questions, questions or you would like to uh, make a uh, contribution to discussion and to raise your hand you need to go to participants in the middle of the screen in the bottom uh, it's called участники in Russian and uh, then if you press this you will see the list of participants on the right and then when you press uh, the right button on your name you can select raise your hand and then we will see that you want to say something. Um, okay, I think we should start and I would like to give a uh, uh, floor to Professor Ram Aftar from Hokkaido University for the first talk. Uh, please Ram, could you check if you can uh, share your screen? Thank you very much Professor Alva for your introduction. Yeah, I'm not able to like You're not. Yeah. Okay, I will see if I can do this. I th we need the organizer. Uh, we need the organizer, Alexei. Please give right to share your screen to all the participants because I don't have the uh, this capacity. Um, okay. Can you? No. Not yet. Yeah, no, okay. Yes. Not yet. Not yet. No. Oh, good, good, good. good. Yes, yes, I think we can now see your demonstration. So that's great. Excellent. Can you see the screen or which one? Yes. Yes, we see your screen. So. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and uh, kind introduction. So because we have very short time, so I will briefly present about what I'm currently working on. So this is the topic of research that I'm going to share is about modeling the Arctic coastal plain lakes that using the machine learning and uh, Google Earth engine. So basically, I'm trying to look into how we can generate the bathymetric data of the Paropos Lake in the coastal regions of the Arctic. So this is a brief background so because of course we don't have much time so here i'm going to uh, start like why we need to study about the best metric because as we know because of the climate change the tens and thousands of lakes are appearing and disappearing in the recent decades and they have been found these lakes permafrost lake have been found in continuous permafrost region in the arctic and pooling of the water is because of the summer season there that causes the surface albedo that's leading to the localized warming and degradation of the region. So therefore, we need to look into how this, because of this climate change of the warming, how the depth or the bathymetry of these lakes are changing. So, yes. So, yeah, so as uh, IPCC and other recent studies, they also have reported the high latitude warmings is 
much higher than the global annual average warming. And as a result, the lake water volume also changing constantly and turning the water bodies to sandy seas, affecting the upland tundra and overall ecosystem in the region. So with the rapid warming in Arctic, there is a dramatic changes in the Arctic hydrology, the lake hydrology, lake ice characteristics and permafrost degradation. Therefore, there is a need to take an intensive research to monitor the lake rich Arctic region at high spatiotemporal resolution. And so in this study, I'm looking into how we can understand the degradation of the lake, lake bodies due to the climate change in Arctic environment by looking into the uh, bathymetric data. If we have the bathymetric data that we can be useful for the volume analysis over a time period. And we can also see what are the changes are happening in the, the lake volume because of the global warming. And the main interest of this research, because we don't have any quantitative bathymetric studies in this region at the largest scale. Therefore, in this study, I tried to attempt uh, to generate the bathymetric data using the satellite data and the ground-based information. So basically, the location of this study area is near the Alaskan region. So the main reason why I selected or why I choose this study area, because there was a camping the, to collect the bathymetric data using the sonar system, a airborne sonar system. So th that's why, because uh, this data, such kind of data is not available for other regions. Therefore, I looked into this data. This data is, uh, is open to public. So if you are interested, you can also download. So these pink symbols with the point samples where they have collected the the sonar based bathymetric data of these lakes. The so I try to look into this area if I can use the signature from these sampling. Hello. Something happened with the translation. Can everyone see the video? Okay, we seem to be experience, experiencing some technical connection problems. So let's wait and see. Uh, I guess it's a problem of connection on the side of Yakutsk. Uh, so I guess these difficulties will soon resolve and we will continue.
So I'll just repeat that. Um, well, I I talked to the organizer of this session, and they're experiencing some technical difficulties. So we are waiting to see if they can stop the translation and restart. So let's uh, just wait, please. So our organizers say that we should um, try to uh, exit this session and uh, come back again. Hello, um, welcome back everyone. I hope we can now continue uh, without interruption. There was some technical issue in Yakutsk that so they suggested to come back. Um, I can see that eight people have come back now. And uh, I think, um, we should try to restart. So I apologize, Professor Aftar, for the interruption to your talk. Uh, can you share your screen again? Um, please switch on your microphone. OK. Yes, now we can hear you. That's good. I apologize. Uh, could you start from this slide where you've been interrupted? Okay, so just. It's a challenging format for the conference when we have participants from at least half the globe geographically distributed. And I guess the internet connection is also challenged by several sessions running at once.
Ну, ничего не могу сказать, мне нужно тут быть. Yes, so now I'm sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Professor Alba, for arranging. Okay, so, so I think my slides... Can you... All right, so I was here, like I just discussed about like the basic background and the data that we I acquired from the this campaign by the Simpson in 2016-17, they acquired the sonar data. So that data I used for machine learning to get the information of the, uh, based on the ground based uh, bathymetric data. So the the I, I have chosen like only 17 lakes in this study because the data because of the limited data the field based data available availability of the field based data and the main reason was I have selected only the bigger lakes the size with more than one kilometer square of surface area so later on I used the Google Earth engine and uh, the various machine learning algorithms to try. Uh, and check which machine lear le learning algorithm works well in this particular area. So we basically process the Landsat 2017 data using the uh, Google Earth engine. And we first uh, import the data and we try to calculate the reflectance. And then we checked whether if there is any relationship with the ground based sonar based bathymetry with the reflectance. And we developed the trainings and finally, we apply those training with use of the various machine learning algorithms like the, we use the three machine learning learning algorithms, decision tree, random forest and support vector machine. So you can see here the results based on these three algorithms. So you can clearly see the area extracted by as well as the bathymetric information from different areas are different because we have chosen different algorithms. So Later on, we checked which algorithm works well and why. So here is the comparison of the, the accuracy of these uh, algorithms. So you can clearly see the, the random forest has the lowest error with the our, uh, random root mean square error is about 0 0.86, while the support vector machine shows the lowest performance. So in terms of accuracy, the decision tree and random forest shows a similar accuracy whereas the accuracy of the support vector machine is poor. So therefore, we can simply say that the random forest uh, algorithms works well in this region. So we applied this uh, random forest algorithm and try to estimate the bathymetric information for all the lakes. So in future, we are trying to look into more data and we will try to apply these algorithms to other areas and we will try to get the bathymetric information. And there are also some challenges, like especially when we calculated the reflectance data and we applied to another year like 2016, but it was not working well. So therefore we need to look more closely why it's not working. So that is uh, our future plan. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Aftar. Uh, because we had technical interruptions, I think you'll keep questions for the discussion part to move on. Yes, sure. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. So the next presentation is by Natalia Maligina. Uh, please, Natalia, you can share your screen and um, switch on your microphone, Natalia. And the presentation, uh, Natalia is from Ural Federal University. She's a senior researcher and she will speak on monitoring, predicting the ecological status of wild, of wild reindeer in the interest of efficient non-depleting use of the Arctic. A technique approach in the era of COVID-19, 2019. Natalia, can you start your presentation, please? Um, is Natalia with us? Natalia Malidina, пожалуйста, начинайте ваш доклад. Включите ваш микрофон и камеру. Well, I think we should, yeah, I'm wondering where, why we are not here in Natalia. Oh, good. Yes. Very nice to see you. Uh, 
Can you share your screen to show your presentation? A demonstration screen. This is the middle um, button in the bottom of Zoom. Наталья, получается э, демонстрировать ваш экран? Ну вот пока не получается. Сейчас я пытаюсь. Э, есть ли какие-то сообщения об ошибке или просто ждете? Ну вот я жду сейчас. То есть нажимаете демонстрация экрана и выбираете нужное окошко. А что говорит? Ничего не говорит. Вы я нажали дем демонстрацию экрана? Sorry, resolving some technical issues. Нажали, но она не получается. Сейчас еще пытаемся. Да, теперь мы уже видим ваш экран. Сейчас, видимо, появится и презентация. Отлично. Сделайте, пожалуйста, ее, впишите в экран. То есть пока слайдов нажмите. Угу. Нажимаем. Yes, uh, please start. You have seven minutes. Please start. Начинайте. <coughs> По-английски можно? Mm -hmm. Over time, I visited some difficult to accessible, dangerous, or remote northern areas of the multifunctional traffic experiences requires large accumulation, organizational, financial, and physical costs. They cause difficulties um, in monitoring wildlife and jeopardize the visual researchers. Succession, it conserves the movement of many birds. And the wild range is the most picturesque example that makes them passionate, but difficult study subjects. Traditional approaches to animal tracking Used few biologists will be and tell us to record a few dozen locations per animal, reviewing on the most general patterns of animal space. To address this gap, we go to new information on unmanned aerial vehicles and homes as a tool that allows us to carry out high risk scenarios. Visiting any location of the Arctic without a charity, without jeopardizing both observer and the object of visiting and investigation. This time, social distance in COVID 19 has made telecommunication the main ability for many researchers. In our work, We can search some accuracy, financial, reliability, and magnitude of planning for of the unmanned aerial vehicles used for the study of the environment. As some example, we take a drone in production into the activity of protected territories of the northern region. <coughs> In the process of receiving the service, purchase plus insurance of drones, training responsibility for non-standard situation, focus on the object of the mission, quality assurance of shooting, time management, time management to access the benefits of the client for the choice of the model. Financial costs, physical activity, effectiveness, and others. How does it work? This is the process, and we propose the new examination organizational work plan of the enterprise as an indicated timetable for the project implementation. 
that reflects some transformation without changing the organizational structure. For later time projects, the timing and the duration of the work will not lose their relevance, but a key creation of the future situation. And also, we have proposed the price for the source service the part of the pricing strategy. We have conducted the calculated the calculation of economic efficiency for three scenarios as a traditional image and showed that the introduction of the UAP rental service in the activity field of the reserve or any other protected territory will bring economic benefits. The introduction of a number of services related to the use of drones in the reserve is quite effective even under a pessimist scenario. And also, we can plot the usability with a comparing this quantity of affecting with the introduction of the service. What do we think? We are not presenting the only way to solve the problem. The researchers are all management at this uncertain time. They are themselves manage their work. How to do, how to work, how to live at this uncertain time. And if you reject the way they approach, Let's think it over. What is the past lifestyle will never come back? How do we do everything and do our research work as a smooth process without order? Thank you for your attention. And do not hesitate to turn to me every time. I am always open for the preparation and think about you and wait for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalia. Indeed, COVID-19 has changed our field plans this year dramatically, and UAV technology is very promising. So again, let's uh, leave the questions for the discussion time. And our next speaker is Professor Ayumi Kotani um, from uh, Nagoya University. Uh, Professor Katani, please, uh, uh, would you start? Natalia, if you can stop the demonstration of your screen, then Professor um, Katani can start his presentation. Uh, <clears throat> excellent, thank you very much. Yes, great. <laughs> So please start and you have seven minutes for your presentation. Can I hear my voice? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very, very much. Well. Thank you. So good afternoon, WGM. Uh, my name is Ayumi Kotani from Nagoya University. So thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk here. And uh, today I'd like to introduce our research at forest observation studies collaborating with uh, a scientist in Yakutsk. Uh, we have interest in unique forest ecosystem in eastern Siberia. Uh, considering the 
climate condition, generally forest ecosystem cannot exist in this area. Here, and because of coldness and dryness. Important background of unique, this uniqueness ecosystem is, of course, permafrost. And coverage of forest in eastern Siberia overlaps to the uh, continuous permafrost area in the northeastern uh, Eurasian continent. And the distribution of uh, deciduous, large, uh, deciduous forest, like a large forest, is also a unique feature in this area. And according to the previous Russian scientist, the, these large forests can exist in this region because of underlying permafrost and its water cycles. As the climate change and the global environmental problems, such as permafrost degradation leads changes in ecosystem and its carbon balance or gas emission to the atmosphere. However, in, on this point, relatively less focus is given to the uh, boreal forest compared to the more fragile Arctic tundra or boundary ecosystems. So here, I'd like to introduce history of collaboration project concerning uh, ecosystem carbon and water balance. Uh, focus on the mainly uh, Russian and Japanese collaboration. So interest of the early uh, generation, it started in the late of 19th. Their interest is uh, characteristics of water and carbon cycles of this unique ecosystem. And through the 2000 uh, years, the, their interest shifts to the relating climate change or global or Arctic uh, perspective. So in the various such uh, various frameworks of national, Japanese national or international research project, collaboration has been continued over the more than uh, 25 years. So last year, we made a uh, collaboratory, made a book to summarize our collaboration works. We particularly focus on the eco-hydrology or permafrost or atmospheric science. And its unique water and carbon cycling system and changing permafrost in recent years are presented in this uh, books. And this is the main authors of uh, this book from Yakutsk and Japan. And this is the content of a book. And you can see various studies uh, directly or indirectly relating to the water and carbon cycles in this book. So I'd like to today introduce in particular uh, observation studies of water and carbon cycles in forests in the central Yakutia. Uh, as briefly, as general introduction, Carbon and energy and water cycles uh, between atmosphere and forest ecosystem is very interrelated through the plant activity and the soil processes. And to get the observation, uh, to collect the fundamental database, data set for understanding these processes and the total balance of mass balance. So uh, the measurement of water and carbon dioxide measurement is conducted to the uh, to global scale. And here is our eastern Siberia. And there is uh, four observation sites uh, covering the, from tundra area to forest area. This observation network is led by Dr. Makishimov. Unfortunately, he is absent here today. But from, uh, from, Institute, uh, sorry, from Institute of Biological Problems of Priosis Zone. And these, collabor uh, these project is based on the international collaboration, Russia, Japanese, and uh, Euro countries, many Euro countries. And there is two observation sites in the uh, large forest in the central Yakutia. One is Spaskaya Park near Yakutsk, and one is the Elgai Station at, on the Aldan River, at, uh, 300 south, south, uh, southeast from the Yakutsk. We started the uh, field of observation in the Spaskaya Park since 1998, 1999. And in the, at the Elgay Station, 2009, the observation started and continued now on. And these 
these stations, we、uh, international researchers or students、uh, conduct various measurements, forest measurement, meteorology or hydrology or soil, soil survey, or such a plant physiology or biomass measurement. And this, uh, these are、uh, some results from our such,、uh, the previous book. So, for example, observation of forest growth or seasonal variation, seasonal sequence of forest phenology are taken、uh, continuously, or response of large forest,、uh, large, large forest and permafrost precipitation changes has been investigated in the Spaskaya Path Station. Or, Using... You have one minute.、Ah, sorry.、Okay. You have one minute.、Yeah. One minute, okay.、Mm-hmm. The comparative, so such as using tower observation data, some CO2 balance is compared, or some hydrological, hydrological studies are conducted. Or more broad region, or some comparing Siberian rivers or Pan Arctic terrestrial carbon budget. So, if you have some interest, please refer our book or I will provide the information later. So, it's the last slide. So, that's all my brief introduction. And our present main task is framework of ARCS2 project. In the, in the opening session, Professor Sugiyama Sensei talked. And our aim is to understand the relationship between large for,、uh, for eco- forest ecosystem and permafrost and greenhouse gas dynamics. So now we are continuing this、uh, theme. But, however, recent my personal interest is to somehow shifting to use these such a scientific results to communicate with local、uh, Yakutsk people, especially young students. So, this is my motivation to attend this meeting. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much.、Uh, very interesting talk. And、uh, as I have been to Spaskai Path Station last year, I can confirm that it's an amazing site with a lot of interesting research being done. So, <clears throat> please keep up the excellent work. And、uh, now we、uh, switch to the next presentation、uh, by Jana Vasilieva. Who is head of the、uh, Technospheric Safety Department at Murmansk State Technical University? And Jana will speak on environmental projects for Arctic territories development.、Um, okay.、Yep. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen.、Uh, my name is Jana Vasilieva. I'm head of Technosphere Safety Department. Murman State Technical University. I would like to present you my report about environmental projects for Arctic territories development. I will try to be brief because there is no much time for each of us to speak. Uh, uh, historically, the research work of Murman State Technical University focuses on areas that almost completely overlap with the work of the Arctic. Council groups. The main focus of development MSTU, innovative technologies of waste processing, environmental protection in the Arctic, monitoring of the natural and anthropogenic environment of the Arctic, biopositive technology of protection of the Arctic marine environment, analysis, modeling, and management of techno- technogenic risks, and green building in the Arctic, sustainable urban. Environment. Projects dedicated to creating a comfortable urban environment in the Arctic play a significant role in the department's research. The slide shows the latest projects implemented by us. In this activity, the department cooperates with various international organizations and, and universities. We hope that this network. Of cooperation will continue to expand. One of the results of cooperation is joint international educational programs, organization of international winter and summer schools. 
the work in this area is based on two directions of creating a comfortable urban environment in the Arctic climate. The work both in the direction related to design solution aimed at minimizing weather changes and ensuring maximum comfort. And with the implementation of the concept climate as an advantage concept of, of winter cities. As part of the concept of winter cities, the department is working on the problem of road handling in winter that is relevant for Russia. Studies have allowed us to establish the identity of the composition of the de-ice mixture and roadside dust and confirm the high content of PM10 and PM2.5 in the air of identical origin. The department has formed proposals for road handling in winter. We also conduct research on study of microclimate and comfort of stay in high latitude climate conditions. A very interesting research topic, in my opinion, is Murmansk atmosphere quality monitoring and improvement. In our research, we get the fields of concentration of harmful substances created by industry and impose them of the fields of harmful substances created by the vehicle emissions. As a result, we get fields of concentration of harmful substances created by all sources of pollution in the city of Murmansk. The slide shows the fields of surface concentration of sulfur oxides, ash and dust in Murmansk caused by the, <clears throat> by the work of industry and cars. At the department, we also conduct very interesting work related to the application of extracellular polymeric substances in the field of water treatment and waste water treatment. Uh, a lot could be said here. But unfortunately, there is not enough time. The slide is quite detailed. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Currently, according to the results of the work, nine types of EPS, six EPS production technology, and one industrial patent have been obtained. In general, and key, uh, it can be noted that the department is engaged in wide range of environmental projects in the areas of clean water, clean air, clean soils, waste management, and sustainable development of the city. I have mentioned only a few of them, and I would like to invite colleagues who would like to cooperate to work together and interact in research. Because, because science is global, research on Arctic issues is relevant for all countries of the region and can be based on scientific international partnership. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Jana, for a very interesting and informative talk. Our next speaker is Mikhail Vafolanev from Kazan Federal University. Uh, he's head of the Institute of Geology and Petroleum Technologies, and he will review Kazan Federal University research in the field of gas hydrates for the development of the Arctic. Um, Jana, could you stop uh, demonstration of your screen so that Mikhail can take over? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. Okay. Uh, I will start my presentation. So it's one second, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Okay, I'll start here. Okay, dear colleagues, first of all, uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. So I would like to show our work in the area of gas hydrates, which are very important in the Arctic area. And uh, of, uh, I want to show a few slides about what is the main problem and what is the main issues in this area. So first of all, we know that gas hydrates is a compound which contains two systems. It's a water and methane as a gas or natural gas. And uh, these systems are widely spread in the world. So today uh, it's well known that methane gas hydrates is the main resources of hydrocarbons in the world. And the main sources are uh, situated in the Arctic region, in the uh, north uh, regions, and it's a uh, very huge resources for the future. And another a very important point about gas hydrates, when we work on the production and transportation of gas and oil in the uh, northern regions and in Arctic regions, we have a problem that it's a flow assurance problem. In this case, gas, gas hydrates are not only the resource, it's uh, some uh, difficulty which uh, uh, complicated the process of hydrocarbon production. So this is two important areas in gas hydrate which are devoted to the Arctic region. Another point is uh, not only flow assurance issues and not only storage uh, in the natural uh, condition, but also uh, there is a problem of transportation and storage of artificial uh, produced gas from the reservoirs. Uh, so everybody of us know the liquefied natural gas technology, which is widely used now in the world by different countries and uh, by Russia, by Japan. Uh, they are one of the leaders in this area. And there is another alternative to this technology, which is transportation and storage of natural gas in the form of gas dehydrates. And this issue uh, has some advantages uh, compared to other technologies. Uh, first of all, uh, 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 transportation and storage in gas hydrate form, it's an environmentally friendly technology. Uh, we can easily extract the gas uh, from the gas hydrates at certain conditions. And also it's uh, one of the safest technology and has a very good capacity for storage. And uh, this is also a very important issue in study of gas hydrates. And in our laboratory in Kazan University, we study all these three issues uh, according to gas hydrates. And we study, uh, first of all, condition of gas hydrates formation and decomposition and determine the main uh, condition which are optimal for the de decomposition or for formation of gas hydrates. And also we develop special chemicals which help in some cases to inhibit the formation of gas hydrates in case of pipelines and production facilities. And second one, we develop some chemicals to storage of gas in gas hydrates form. So it's also our about in this area. And we're also working in the area of production of gas from gas hydrates as a future of energy sphere. So this is the main direction which are, we are doing in Kazan University. And uh, now I want to show some results and some equipment for these studies so we can study uh, the gas hydrate decomposition in, and uh, formation in condition very close, first of all, to a reservoir condition that we have on the uh, deep offshore reservoirs and also which we have in some continental uh, reservoirs uh, which have this condition and we can and study the formation and the composition in the dynamic mode, which is very close to the condition which we have in transportation pipelines. So here there are some equipment for this one. This is some uh, reactors with uh, high pressure and uh, low temperature condition for study of dynamic condition. This is for static condition studies. And also we have some equipment which help us to understand the mechanism of the process, which is also very important to further prediction of gas hydrate formation in the natural uh, resources and in the artificial pipelines for transportation and storage of gas. So uh, some of uh, our results, which we could achieve together with our partners, uh, here there are some results about the uh, new reagents, which we propose 
for the new technology for storage and transportation of natural and associated gas in gas hydrate form. And uh, we develop special reagents which help to improve the uh, time, so to make the gas hydrate formation much faster and uh, to make a deeper conversion, which help us to make a better storage of natural gas in this form. And details you can find in this paper presented on this slide. Another things which we achieved in our studies is the uh, development of chemicals which help us not to produce gas hydrate in uh, transportation pipelines. We develop special new class of biodegradable inhibitors which help to prevent the gas hydrate formation in the pipeline transportation. So first of all, these in the reagent help us to uh, prolongate the time of uh, gas hydrate formation and second, uh, they also decrease the uh, conversion. So this is opposite effect, which we need in uh, production and transportation of natural gas directly in the offshore oil fields. And uh, one important point for these regions, we know that uh, when we work in offshore, in uh, uh, Arctic region, the ecology uh, and uh, problem is very important. And we develop special type of reagents, which based on the natural resources, for example, castor and sunflower oil, which help us to have a very good biodegradability campaign with some commercial reagents. So it helps us to improve the application and improve the ecological issues uh, for usage of oil field chemistry in offshore reservoirs. And also important point when we work with sea uh, uh, offshore reservoirs in our problem, not only gas hydrate, but also corrosion. And in our case, we are studying and developing the reagents which has a, a dual efficiency. So not only stop the hydrate formation, but also can stop the corrosion. It's also very important for seawater, which has a high salinity and a high content of uh, aggressive environment for the pipelines and for in our equipment. So this is also very important in our study, which uh, we developed together with our partners. And the last study and last uh, point, which I want to mention in my report, this is about production of gas from, from gas hydrate reservoirs. We are developing the technology which based on the injection of CO2 uh, to the uh, offshore reservoir and uh, replace of uh, methane by CO2. So we can make a capture of CO2 and production of methane as a uh, resources for the energy sector and for uh, material sector. So here there is a general concept which we develop here and uh, we show some efficiency of this technology in our current results. And uh, in the final, uh, the final stage of my presentation, I want to conclude that our group is working in the field of gas, gas hydrates, especially focusing on natural gas and methane and developing some reagents from one side to produce the methane from the gas hydrate reservoirs. Uh, second, to develop some inhibitors which help to prevent the gas hydrate formation and corrosion in the pipelines in transportation from the production facilities. And the third point that we do in our research is the development of special technology for further storage and uh, transportation of natural gas using gas hydrate technology which is also work, uh, how to say, a very uh, interesting technology, not only in Russia, but in Japan. And uh, one of the companies which focused on this is a Mitsui company from Japan. Then I want to say thank you to all the uh, uh, collaborators of this work, Gupkin University, yes, Science, to finish. And also this work was done uh, with the support of Russian uh, Foundation of Basic Research, uh, Arctic Resources Program. And some photos of Kazan, welcome to our city, to our university. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mikhail, for a very um, important and informative talk. And now I will give the final talk of this session, um, which is uh, focused on some work in um, near Yakutsk. Um, and this is a, uh, this is actually a, a short information on a joint study that we are starting with Dr. Ram Aftar. Uh, 
Um, we have submitted the research proposal uh, to the Russian Foundation of Basic Research, uh, which is focused on applying new technologies uh, with remote sensing data and ground rate observations for study of changes in the forests in northern Russia. And the key site is in uh, Central Sahara Republic near Yakutsk. Uh, I will talk today about area around research stations Pascha Pat, which has already been mentioned by uh, Professor Katani in particular. We have done uh, some field research in this area in 2019 in the summer, measuring the forest, tree stands, uh, conducting uh, UAV surveys and ground measurements of the, uh, how the plants and forests reflect radiation, so how we can see them in satellite imagery. And we also measured leaf area index. Um, and uh, here, this slide shows, well, on the right, you see a more traditional optical remote sensing image. Vegetation here is in red. This is a small lake, and this is a location of Spaska Spad Station and of our field sites. And these are uh, radar satellite imagery. This is something publicly available from Sentinel-1 satellite. And this is an example of the image that we received from our uh, Japanese colleagues from Hokkaido University, from Professor Ram Aftar, which are more detailed. And this presentation shows some preliminary work on this imagery. Uh, so what we did is we used our field data and then we processed satellite imagery with uh, specialized software and analyzed correspondences between the field data and UAV survey results and the uh, radar imagery. <clears throat> uh, so these are examples of our sites in uh, birch forests, birch and large forests, and in large forests, trees are between eight and 10 meters high. All of these sites are uh, near Spaska Bad Station. Uh, we had to process the radar imagery, subset it to actually look at our study area, uh, calibrated, uh, transformed to specific units, and also corrected with a digital terrain model because radio imagery is very sensitive to terrain disturbances, distortions. And then we calculated new images, uh, specific parameters and indices. So uh, a radar image that we used has several polarizations which show um, how different objects like forests and river floodplains reflect the radar signal. And then you can calculate uh, specialized indices. Uh, HH here is horizontal polarization received, emitted and received. HV is horizontal and vertical polarization. VV is vertical, vertical polarization. Uh, and uh, you can see in the image here that the river floodplain, this is a Lena river floodplain, is dark because the radar signal reflects uh, very weakly, and then the forests uh, to the west of the floodplain are bright because forests reflect and diffuse the radio energy quite efficiently. Then we also had our uh, field data and UAV survey data, so we could actually calculate uh, and pinpoint every tree within our field plot. This is an example of one of the field plots, and this is the locations of trees overlaid on the radar imagery. So what we did that for each 10 meter cell, we combined measurements for all the trees. We have field measurements and UAV measurements, so we can actually calculate the growing stock volume, the amount of wood uh, in the trees within each, within each cell. And then we compared this with the radar indices that we have from the air radar imagery. And uh, here are the first results, which I should say are not <laughs> very good because the highest R squared in the correlation that we have for uh, radar disturbance in, uh, index is about 0 0.2. And the reason for this is that we only use one image for the um, summer. Uh, so, uh, and also the detail, the level of detail in these images is not very high. Uh, so what we need to do next is to use multi-temple radar imagery. And we're already talking to our colleagues in Hokkaido University about getting more of data from Japanese ALIS-2 satellite. Uh, we also know that the indices and ratios are better than the original radar signals, so at least the method is correct. 
And then our future plans um, are to continue this work in multi-temple series and also to conduct more field work in next summer near Yakutsk uh, to collect more data on the forest. Uh, and we are considering one of the options is just to have a small expedition, but the other option we hope we can join to the field school, which traditionally runs at Spaskai Pad Station each summer and um, contribute to teaching Japanese and Russian students and bring our students. So we are open for collaboration uh, in this matter. Thank you. Uh, and at this point, I would like to finish my talk. And uh, this is the time, the most interesting time in our session, when we can switch to discussing uh, our potential research collaborations. Now we have a good idea about different fields of research that everyone is conducting. Uh, and I also would like to mention the HARP uh, funding program. We already been trying to uh, organize workshops under this program, it's very good. So I uh, think that everyone should consider taking part. And it's a really great opportunity for collaboration between uh, Russian and Japanese researchers as well as a new ARC uh, CS program. So at this point, uh, I would like to invite everyone who would like to contribute to discussion to raise their hand. So if you go to uh, participants or участники, you can see the list of participants on the right on your screen. And there is a little button in the left, uh, in the right bottom corner, raise your hand, поднять руку. So if you can indicate who would like to speak, I would like to invite speakers for discussion. Or if you can't, if you cannot find the raise your hand, поднять руку buttons, then you can just switch on your microphone and speak because at the moment we have no hands. Uh, дорогие друзья, я предлагаю начать дискуссию, поэтому uh, если вы хотите выступить, uh, по возможности в списке участников нажмите внизу справа кнопку поднять руку. Если вы не находите, просто включите ваш микрофон и скажите, что вы хотите выступать. На всякий случай также обращаюсь к организатору. Есть ли у участников возможность включить микрофон? Can you switch your microphone? Anyone who would like to speak? Please. Well, I would like to ask Ayumi Katani, Professor Ayumi Katani, to say uh, something about uh, your experience because you have a very good example of uh, successful collaboration with uh, Yakutsk scientists. Uh, so maybe you can share some of your experiences and uh, give us some advice how to start successful Japanese-Russian collaboration. Advice, <laughs> but uh, actually I'm not a newcomer, but uh, yes. Exactly. But, yes, yes. But my previous boss at first visit Yakutsk in the 19th. In that situation is different now from now. Mm -hmm. some, uh, he says the first impression and friendship is the most important thing, he said. But uh, in this uh, the current situation is probably a little bit changed, but uh, some fundamental is not changed. So, but uh, actually, I, uh, every every time I'd like to seek new collaboration partner in the Russian or international one. So, so sorry, I cannot answer <laughs> your question. But such a, using such an opportunity uh, and. Uh, Yes. I think it's a good sorry, good sorry, answer. Sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a good answer that your collaboration, you said it's, it's about mm -hmm. 20, more than 20 years, 25 mm -hmm. years, as you showed in your presentation. And yes, situation are changing, but scientists are not changing. So uh, once you found good links, you can expand. And thank you for offering uh, to expand to new collaborators. I think mm -hmm. colleagues for everyone is a good chance to think if you collaborate in forest carbon research, 
for example, our group would like to collaborate with you, <laughs> Professor Katani. Thank you, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but I think there is a scope here for wider collaboration. Mm -hmm. So uh, would anyone like to say something? Uh, propose some collaboration idea? Uh, do you have some ideas you'd like to share with this group? Because we still have about 23 minutes, so we can discuss freely. Коллеги, кто хотел бы высказаться, предложить uh, темы для потенциального сотрудничества, пожалуйста, uh, включайте свой микрофон и высказывайтесь. Um, so once again, who would like to say something? Natalia, yes, Natalia, please, uh, you can say. Uh, I, would like, I would like to propose uh, the cooperation for the monitoring of the Arctic ecosystems and especially the key species, wild reindeer, mm -hmm. or the new information technologies. Wild reindeer is the animal of movement. Very difficult to follow it. And uh, I would like, once again, the cooperation to monitor the movement of this wonderful uh, animal. Thank you. Um, well, I have one question for your talk, Natalia. Uh, when you run UAV services, you have to be not very far from your UAV, well, maybe a few kilometers. So uh, how do you see, uh, so you will have to have some local researcher running the UAV on the land. How do you uh, plan this um, potential project? Uh, I, I have planned my potential project uh, because I worked much time, 20 years, in Tanya, and I know how it is difficult to organize the field work. And as I have told, I monitored the wild reindeer, and I know how it is difficult to arrange this work. And uh, this project with the um, drones is uh, some, some way out to do that. This is the first one. And our new era of COVID, when we are everybody sit at home, and uh, we may do that without interruption, our field work, our research work. We may sit in our, uh, we may sit with our computers and follow uh, the movement of our animals, the condition of the animals with the drones. Uh, who are which are controlled by the people at the local uh, at the location of um, our interest. Mm -hmm. Two positions. The first is very difficult to organize and to monitor the animals, the animals of movement. And the second position is to 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 be at the ear of Coronavirus. Yes, so remote locations for field work are the best because we have less people, <laughs> so we are the safe there. I would like to add here that uh, it's very interesting to combine UAV surveys, uh, which are very detailed but local in scale, with uh, wider remote sensing studies from satellites. Uh, I know that reindeer are monitored also with special. Uh, special transmitters and also you can monitor the habitat using remote sensing imagery from satellite. I wonder if Professor Aftar, Ram Aftar, has some comments on satellite remote sensing, maybe how it could be applied here or in other similar areas of research. Yes. Would you like yeah, to comment on Yes, this? so I want to just uh, mention one point, especially when we talk about the wild animals. So use of thermal data is effective because it can provide some information because of the, it can give us the temperature profile of the animals and the surrounding environment. 
so especially in there are some studies i read some papers the some uh, scientists they use the thermal data to identifying the because in winters what happened like these uh, animals sometimes they uh, go together or they stay together in one place so in one place there are five or six uh, deer or reindeer all together with the, they live in a kind of family so to identify because all the surrounding area is completely covered by snow and they store some food at certain location and they try to live together so in that case to identify the locations or the hibernation sites of the reindeer or deer may be much more uh, easy because there are more, uh, many animals so that's that is one study i read so use of thermal data is also, is promising especially in case of uh, this wild animals and this is data from satellites not uav so it's actually from high above yeah satellites yes yes, yes. Mm -hmm. but yeah. in case of satellites we have only one lens set uh, thermal sensor that is uh, available so the resolution is a problem but mm -hmm. somehow if we can identify the locations by using optical and then we check the thermal data then we can merge or we can do the uh, we can use the fusion image fusion approach to merge the thermal data with other uh, high resolution optical data to to validate our results that is also possible Yes, yes, very good. Yeah, we had a similar study in the White Sea for the seal pup colonies, for small seals, where you have high resolution data to identify the colonies and then other data um, to look at them. Uh, Jana, would you like to yeah. say something? Yes, Please. I would like to say a few words about this uh, theme. My colleague, uh, help, help me. Hi, I'm here to help with the translation. Yes, мы имеем опыт использования квадрокоптеров для мониторинга качества воздуха в арктическом регионе. In our university, we have the experience of using drones to monitor the air quality in the Arctic region. Однако мы заметили uh, целый ряд проблем, которые ну, в настоящее время мешают использованию квадрокоптеров uh, в, именно в арктическом регионе. Uh, Во-первых, это чувствительность дрона к погодным условиям. First of all, the drones are very uh, sensible uh, when we talk about the weather uh, conditions. Uh, дождь, ветер, снег, низкая температура. So, for example, such such uh, phenomena as uh, rain, fog, snow, uh, hard winter, and so on can be a problem. Uh, в результате квадрокоптер не может лететь, либо происходит оледенение, либо происходит падение квадрокоптера, и он не может продолжать uh, свою деятельность. And as a result, the drone just can't fly and it falls down. Uh, ну, возможно, да, yes, падает. It, it may fall down. Да. Uh, следующий момент – это маленькая емкость имеющихся в настоящее время батарей, uh, которые не могут позволить осуществлять мониторинг длительное время. Uh, and the next problem is the low capacity of the batteries uh, that the drones have, and this means that we cannot monitor the area for a long time. То есть это максимум два часа, и чем ниже температура окружающей среды, тем меньше эти два часа. So we're talking about two hours as a maximum, and when we have a uh, low temperature, this amount of time is even smaller. Соответственно, мы сейчас работаем над этими проблемами, но проблемы эти в основном технические, и, насколько я понимаю, они актуальны не только для нас, для Мурманского региона, над этими проблемами бьются производители квадрокоптеров из Европы, и мы имеем с ними такой регулярный контакт по улучшению качества квадрокоптеров. Uh, so now we are working on these problems, but they are not unique uh, for our region only, because we have contacted the uh, manufacturers of the drones in Europe, and we're trying to solve these issues together and discuss them. 
Поэтому по факту, на самом деле, будущее про квадрокоптеров, конечно, интересно, но в данный момент для запуска его на большие территории как бы, существует очень много факторов, которые не позволяют его отправлять в длительный и далекий полет. So to sum up, uh, we can say that using drones is a very promising technology, but there are a lot of factors that prevent uh, us from sending them to investigate larger areas or just to fly for a long time. Ну, на самом деле есть ряд направлений, по которым можно э, как бы решать этот вопрос. Можно было бы тоже вместе как-то объединиться, поделиться опытом и пробовать, возможно, мурманские режимы, которые имеют тоже свои особенности, были бы интересны другим участникам. So this may be a topic or an area for the future cooperation, like exchanging our experience in using drones for various studies, uh, perhaps using the regimes or uh, operation modes that we're using here in Minsk for, for the other areas. Спасибо. Thank you. Thank you, Jana, for this very useful uh, technical summary. And I would say that our group, for one, is a, quite interested in collaboration. We also use drones in the forests. It would be very good to exchange experience. And now I would like to ask um, other speakers and participants. Uh, you don't have to be a speaker, a presenter to uh, ask a question or make a comment. So if anyone to, would like to ask any questions or make further comments, please. Uh, it's opportunity uh, and it could be drones or could be any other topic uh, that we discussed or haven't discussed. Um, so who else would like to make a comment or ask a question? Um, yes, Yelena Golubiva from Moscow State University. Please, you can say it, uh, make your comment or ask your question. Yelena Ilyinishna, включите микрофон, пожалуйста. Yeah. Пожалуйста, включите ваш микрофон. Проблем. Yes, we can hear you now. Ага. Uh -huh. Now you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Olga. It's, Olga is my colleague, and maybe, uh, maybe uh, she helped me, uh, uh, helped me to uh, speak English. Uh, okay, I can translate if you like, <laughs> if, if you need. Uh, Maybe uh, maybe it's better because uh, my English is not uh, so good. Я работаю давно на севере и вместе с Ольгой эти проекты очень интересные. На них выросло много специалистов. I have been working in the north for a long time. These projects are very interesting, uh, not just as research projects, but because they help to raise new generation of scientists uh, from our students. И уже много лет мы работаем вместе с нашими британскими коллегами. For a long period of time, we have been working with our British colleagues and their students. И мне кажется, что вот сейчас такой момент когда, может быть, больше внимания уделить результатам наших исследований, которые для человека. And I think now is really the right time to focus on our research, which is for people, for humans. Потому что проблемы на севере, так же, как и растения, и животные, Люди тоже находятся в экстремальных условиях. Because in, in the north, not only animals and plants, but people are also uh, existing in the extreme conditions of the north. Uh, поэтому 
это и климатические условия, и ресурсы, и, конечно, те изменения, которые происходят в окружающей среде. Yes, this is of course uh, climatic extremes and natural resource issues and also environmental issues that uh, humans have created themselves in these uh, extreme conditions. Поэтому мне кажется, что нам нужно включать в наши исследования человека и может быть еще аспект образование. И тут вот наши японские коллеги имеют очень большой опыт организации образования и дистанционного, что особенно актуально вот во время пандемии. So I think it's very important that we include in our research the human perspective. Uh, we make it human oriented and also the education perspective. And uh, our Japanese colleagues are very experienced in, in this, in, uh, in education, including distant education, which is now very, very topical in the current year of COVID-19. Вот поэтому, uh, хотя я сама биолог, uh, я призываю немножко больше внимания самому человеку, малым городам, проблеме uh, использование ресурсов, особенно невозобновляемых на so, севере. Although I myself, I am a bi biologist, I think we should include human perspective in all of our research, uh, population, small cities on the north and uh, other aspects. Но самое главное, что я хотела сказать, что любой, любые новые контакты uh, или новые темы с коллегами, с которыми работаем уже давно, и российскими, и зарубежными, они всегда приносят очень новые, очень интересные, новые и неожиданные результаты. And the most important thing is that uh, all, every new contact, every new idea that we implement brings new and exciting results. So I think this session and this uh, seminar is a good opportunity to start new collaborations and Uh, foster new ideas, new research ideas. Желаю всем здоровья и хорошего настроения. I wish everyone health, very good health and very good mood. Да. Thank you, и Елена. Успеха нашему семинару. And success to our seminar. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thank Olga. you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anyone else would like to say something? And uh, again, well, uh, not just speakers, but also participants, if you like. Professors and students, no restrictions. Um, maybe our Japanese colleagues um, who are taking part would like to say something. Uh, Professor Shiro Tatsuzawa, would you like to say something? I know your research is human related. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, I I am very glad to see you here. I think we probably met in Norilsk during the meeting there. Yeah, would you like to say something to participants? Thank you very much. Um, so I know not enough uh, uh, examples of collaboration between your country, Russia and Japan, but uh, I'm belonging to some very small project uh, to study a reindeer, wild reindeer migration and uh, its influence to northern uh, small number of people's life especially in uh, Yakutia. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, by this uh, uh, project, from this project, uh, we know some big uh, changes of uh, relationship be, uh, among them, uh, especially uh, on uh, migration route and uh, uh, number and uh, distribution of wild reindeer and a small number of people, especially uh, Ebenk, Ebenk people, uh, 
uh, already cannot hunt them enough, uh, especially in Olenyuk district. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have uh, <laughs> we have uh, not enough, uh, of course, not enough uh, research money and uh, uh, educational uh, uh, educational uh, time and space a uh, uh, time and space for uh, educate uh, young uh, young local people uh, uh, so from now on uh, uh, just now uh, i sent uh, a short mail to natalia san to make our new uh, oh, oh, oh. how can you say new network uh, cyber network for study and uh, mm -hmm. conservation of wild India and indigenous people life mm -hmm. as a new Arctic thematic network so uh, this should be a very good uh, new chance for us to exchange our uh, uh, experience uh, and uh, uh, experience okay. with not only with uh, scientists but with uh, local people, especially with local young people. So this is a very good uh, point uh, uh, I, I get in this session. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, very this much. is a really good remark. And thank you for already starting contacts. Uh, I think everyone in this session has a list of participants and the contact details. Uh, if you don't, you can ask the organizers. So yes, please contact uh, anyone uh, whose research is interesting to you and we'll make new links and start new projects. I also uh, recommend uh, Russian participants to be in touch with Marina Lamaeva. She is very knowledgeable. She is a coordinator of the HARP program and she is also knowledgeable of the other uh, funding opportunities and projects uh, in the context of this meeting and beyond. Uh, we have really good experience of working with her and uh, she can put you in touch with relevant Japanese colleagues. So. Um, use this seminar as a new networking opportunity to start new projects. Uh, would anyone else like to say something to conclude this session? Uh, maybe Professor Aftar, as my co-moderator, would like to say something uh, to finish. Yeah, thank you very much, yeah, uh, Professor Olgai. I think the first opportunity, we should utilize this as a platform to build our collaboration and do some collaborative research as we have seen in this group especially we have been the common thing is about the environment and we have like the different presenters they have shared their experiences the techniques that we can utilize and we can build our collaborative uh, research for the future now we are talking about sdgs so where we need to look into more uh, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research so therefore, uh, we need to build a big network and we need to do more collaborative research. So this is a good opportunity to discuss and to collaborate in future. So I'm also looking forward to collaborate with you people and let's work together. Thank you. Thank you. So our time is um, up for our session, but yes, please use this opportunity to collaborate. And in 20 minutes, we will meet again in the plenary session uh, so that we can sum up results of the four sessions and uh, go forward with our collaborations. Thank you very much to everyone. I think we had worked very well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. We'll be in touch. Thank you very much. So we can, uh, uh, yeah, we can leave this session. Goodbye, thank you. Goodbye. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.